where your head at? Dang, don't wanna talk business, business. I guess I gotta be the one to see the summer. Who really in this, in this? We so fed up. My life, 10 up. Your time, been up. Big prayers, sent up. Uh, couldn't do without him, out of Glad that I found him, found him. Crowd really wild it, wild it. I'm kicking it, shot it. Earlier in the summer, I uh, was standing right here in this spot, uh, right with the Capitol in the background and, and right in front of City Hall. And I come downtown to participate in the Black Lives Matter protest and rally. And I'm standing here in front of City Hall and I'm, I'm talking with Pastor Sean Holland from Epicenter of Worship. Uh, up the street uh, down from Costa Checks comes one of his um, one of his band members. His name's Luther. And, and Luther shows up here and it's, it's like nine in the morning. I mean, it's not even the middle of the day. It's not even the heat of the day. And, and Luther has got sweat just pouring down his face. Luther's from New York. He's a professional musician. He's played in Sean's worship band. But he's come back here for this moment. And he, he didn't judge the weather right. And he's wearing full-length black wool pants. He is hurting. When I find this out, I, I think about the backpack that I've got on. And in that backpack, I know that there's an extra pair of shorts. Does Tom always, Pastor Tom always walk around with an extra pair of shorts in his backpack? <laughs> there had been uh, incidences where the police had tear gassed protesters. And if you get tear gassed, you want an extra pair of clothes to put on. And Luther and, and Sean and I start walking towards the Capitol. Sometimes it takes God's spirit a long time to work on me. Or maybe I should say, I take a long time to get open to God's spirit. That pair of shorts I got in my backpack, they're a nice pair of shorts. And I might need them, but I don't need them right this minute. God brings this story to my mind from uh, the very early stages of Jesus' ministry. And he's out visiting his cousin, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is preaching out in the wilderness. And John says this to those who are listening. He says, listen, if you have an extra pair of shorts in your backpack on a hot sunny day at a Black Lives Matter protest down at the Capitol, then give it to the musician who's sweating uh, crazy. Well, that's not exactly what John the Baptist says. Here's what he says. He says, uh, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. There's a little more to this context than just this one individual moment. Sarah and I, my wife and I, have decided that this was going to be the year without a purchase. Some of you are like, what in the world? How can you live without making any purchases? You can't live without making some purchases. You got to buy food. I still have to buy deodorant, even though I work at home all the time now. Shampoo, soap, you know, the basics. We weren't going to buy anything that we wouldn't use up in that year. So I knew that if I gave this pair of shorts away that I wouldn't get another in return. Now I've had all kinds of temptations during this pandemic to buy stuff. Most of them I have been able to ward off. Lots of gadgets and gizmos, a new desk and a new chair because I work at home. You know, one thing that I did end up buying, I didn't even realize that I had just broken our, our sort of practice for the year was I bought a new Sycamore Creek Church mug because they came in I thought I want to have one of those and, and I bought it and then I got home and I was like oh wait I wasn't supposed to buy anything uh, this year. I know that if I give him these shorts uh, I'm, I'm not going to easily be able to replace them but once I finally get up here to the Capitol steps and I see him sweating and he's, he's getting ready to play the piano and through the heat of the day God's spirit finally gets through my hard heart through my clenched fist and I open up I say to Luther listen Luther I got a pair of shorts in my backpack you want to try them on and I felt God's spirit pushing me just a little bit further and, and I said to Luther hey listen if if I don't see you after this, uh, for some reason, you, you just keep those shorts, don't worry about them, they're yours. Well, I never got those shorts back. I haven't had a day go by that I didn't have a pair of shorts to wear. I think the pandemic has shown us that a lot of the things that we chase after are ultimately not particularly valuable. There's been an increased awareness of structural racism, and it's shown us how many of those carrots aren't equitably distributed. But the pandemic has also brought new temptations for chasing some of the same old stuff, some of the same old idols, the counterfeit goods, the, the things that don't actually deliver on what they promise. You see, a counterfeit is a close representation of something valuable that actually doesn't have any valuable. I found a $100 bill in our shred pile the other day. When I first saw it, I was like, Sarah, why is there a $100 bill in our shred pile? It was a counterfeit, close representation, but it didn't have 
any real value. Counterfeit goods don't deliver on what they promise. They ultimately become idols, and idols anything that we pursue more than we pursue God. We end up chasing after these things. We get on a wheel and we, we run and we run and we run and we're disappointed, we're disappointed, we're frustrated, and we, we can't get off the wheel. And what this series has been all about, it's been about like helping us get off of that wheel, helping us to be able to identify counterfeits, fame, perfectionism, comfort, approval. And today we're gonna look at the counterfeit of money and stuff. How do we chase after after money and stuff. During this pandemic, it's cost us $108 more a month to work at home. $182 more on groceries, $120 more on utilities. There have been some things we've spent less on, childcare, travel, eating out, clothes, but when it all adds up, it's cost us $108 more a month to work at home. We're gonna go back to the studio live, and I want you to talk about this in the chatterbox. What have you spent more on during the pandemic and what have you spent less on? And if you want to be really courageous, if you want to be really honest, what have you spent more on that, that you thought it would deliver and it didn't end up delivering what you thought it would? How did it end up being a false idol? I'll see you in the studio. This whole series, we have been trying to identify, help you identify counterfeit carrots. Carrots that we chase that end up becoming idols. They don't deliver on what they promise. Today we're looking at money and stuff. That can be a carrot, it can be a, it can be a counterfeit good. It, it can be something that we chase that ends up not being good. I'm here in front of downtown Lansing. Right now it's the Comerica Bank, but if you look at like way up top, it's the oldest bank in Lansing. I think most of us, uh, if we're really honest with ourselves, would say, at least we'd admit, during the pandemic especially, that it'd be nice to be rich. <laughs> It'd be nice to be filthy rich, right? To have uh, enough money to make your home awesome, to not have to have worried about work, uh, childcare, or any, any of that stuff. How many of us are actually filthy rich? How many of us are rich? I mean, go ahead in the comments and tell me, like if, if you would call yourself rich, raise your hand, like, you know, give us a woo woo out there. Almost uh, all of us are not like filthy rich in what we'd call it, but, but again, if we're honest, we'd, like to be rich we'd pursue it if we could in fact many of us are pursuing it what would you do for a lot of money let's say five million bucks buzzfeed did a whole survey on this is kind of shocking what people be willing to do for five million dollars 54 percent would listen to country music for the rest of their life all right i know some of you out there you're like what that is that a problem 42 percent would have all their teeth removed that's crazy I guess you'd have the money to pay for the dentures. This is actually scary. 50% would be willing to have one random person die so that they could have $5 million. All right, sicko people out there. That's like some horror movie, right? I think there was a horror movie about that. 27% would give up sex for 30 years. That's a tough one. 24% uh, would live in solitude for the next 20 years. So you'd have a lot of money, but you wouldn't have anybody to spend it anytime, anybody to spend it on, any time to spend it with. What would you consider rich? Like how much do you have to make to consider yourself or, or somebody that you know rich? Just take a minute and write that number in the comments section. What's rich? What's the number, all right? Back to the studio audience for this question about who is rich. All right, that was an interesting conversation. There's this question of how much we have to make to be rich. And some of you might say, if you make $25,000, you'd say, if I'd make $50,000, then I'd be rich. And those of you who are making $50,000, like, hey, now that, that ain't rich, friends. Uh, if I made $100,000, then I would be rich. And those of you who are making $100,000, and there are some of you who are watching this who are in that bracket or higher, you're like, man, that's not rich. If, if I made a million dollars, then I, I would be rich. <laughs> and it turns out if you make a million dollars, you'd be like, no, if I make $2.3 million, then I would be rich. In fact, Charles Schwab did a, some research on this, and it turns out that that's the magic number, $2.3 million. So I guess if you only make $2 million, you're not rich. But if you make another $0.3 million, then you are rich. The problem is, is that the answer to that question is a moving target. You, you make a certain amount and, and, and you're not rich and so you need more. And you need more and that's the problem. That's, that's the chasing the carrot, friends. 
that's the thing that, that we think it, it promises to deliver something, but it turns out being, being a counterfeit. It doesn't deliver on what it promises. It ends up being an idol, that we pursue it more than we pursue God. Jesus said, watch out! Be on guard of all kinds of greed because life does not consist in the abundance of things. The value of your life is not in the abundance of your, the capacity of stuff you own. It's found in somewhere else. It's, it's found in some other place by chasing some, some other, not a carrot, but something good, something that's truly good, something that is, that's right and true and beautiful and good. Back to that Charles Schwab survey, 60% of people admitted that they watch and look on social media and wonder, how can their friends afford that? 30% admitted that they spend more money on, on things with their friends than they have money to spend. 34% of people are influenced to spend money on experiences that they don't have the money to spend on. It's the end of the summer, right? Like there's, there's just a little bit more. We gotta pack everything in. We gotta, we gotta soak it for all it's worth. Here's the carrot. What you think you need is what you don't have. What you think you need is what you don't have. And what you really need is you need God. You need less of what's temporary and more of what's eternal. Jesus tells the story of, of this uh, farmer and he, he has a bumper crop and, and he's got all of this, all of this food that's come in and, and he doesn't even have enough barns to, to, to carry it all. And so he says, I'm going to build bigger barns and I'm going to sit back and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to relax and be happy. This is how Jesus ends the story. He says, but God said to him, you fool, for tonight your life will be taken from you. He was chasing more of what's temporal rather than more of what's eternal. This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves, for themselves on earth rather than storing up treasures in heaven. Now let's be really clear, God wasn't mad because this guy was rich. Who gave him the riches, right? Like who gave him the bumper crop? It was God. But, but it, was, it was what he did with it, it was where his heart went after he received it. I've got some good news for you and I've got some bad news for you. What do you want first? Well, I'm gonna give you the good news first, right? Here's the good news. The good news is that you're rich. You're rich. Now, some of you are thinking like, I don't feel rich. Um, I've, got, I've got more bills than I've got money, Tom. I'm not rich. But, but by any like measure of the world like as a whole, most of us who are watching this, we're rich. Most of us who are watching this are rich. Nearly half of the world lives on less than $5.50 a day. Nearly half of the world lives on less than $5.50 a day. 10% of the world live on less than $2 a day. Now, again, even if you consider yourself poor, if you're watching this, um, you probably live on more than $2 a day. By, by most standards, we are all rich. You can tell how rich you are by what bothers you. You, you got in the fast food uh, drive through lane and it's taking longer than, than you thought it was. And when, when, you, when you pull away, you realize like that, that the dipping sauce wasn't the dipping sauce that you ordered. Or, or you order wings to go and you get home for your kid's birthday and you realize that you accidentally ordered hot sauce rather than the normal sauce. I'm not speaking from experience here or anything. You know, instead of thinking about like, we have a phone that will let us watch and listen to music from all over the world we get upset because the Wi-Fi is stuttering and it's not streaming well we can't watch our Netflix show and you drive past 14 restaurants to get to the one that you really like the one that you prefer where, where somebody else um, raised the cow and, and and milked the milk and made the cheese and and melted it on the hamburger for you let me be really clear here some of us are really hurting medical bills have piled up utility bills, we've been furloughed, we've been laid off, our hours have been reduced, we're a single parent, uh, we don't know how we're going to get to the end of the week, we we're not sure how we're going to put food on the table. Um, there, there are some real significant situations and, and I'm not trying to say that, that money won't help provide those basic things. But for most of us who are watching this, we got to admit it, we're rich. I'm not trying to make us feel guilty. I'm trying to make us feel responsible so that we're not living like this with our money and stuff. We're living like this. 
you know this is chasing after the carrot this is this is chasing after something temporal this is chasing after God this is chasing after something eternal all right the Bible clearly states that money can be a gift of God money that that is that is honestly that is justly that is ethically earned and and the Bible also says that money can be very uh, unjustly and unethically and dishonestly earned all right wealth can often be accumulated in that way but money can be an honest gift from God. The writer of Ecclesiastes says, Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift from God. You don't apologize for gifts, right? Like if you have a good marriage, if you, if you have if you have a healthy kids, if you have a car that gets you to work, you don't say, listen, I'm sorry for those things. You say, thank you, God. But then you ask the question, how do I share those things? How, how do I... How do I not live like this, but how do I, how do I live an open-handed life pursuing God rather than pursuing money and stuff, which never delivers on what it promises? All right, I told you there was good news and there was bad news, so let's talk about the bad news, all right? The good news is, what was the good news? Say it with me. I'm rich. All right, here's, here's the bad news. I'm rich. <laughs> it's, it's the flip side of the coin. If, if you're rich, then you are at a spiritual disadvantage, Jesus says. Jesus uh, has this experience where this guy comes to him and he says, Jesus, what do I need to do to inter inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you need to follow the commandments. And, and the guy says, well, listen, I've done all of those things. I've followed the Moses' Ten Commandments. What else do I need to do? And Jesus says, well, if you want to be perfect in love, if you want to love perfectly the way that God has loved you perfectly, then sell all of your stuff and give it to the poor. And that man walks away with his head down because he was very rich. He held on to his stuff more than he held on to God. Jesus looked at him and he said, How hard it is for the rich to enter into the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Here's the bad news. You're rich. It puts you at a spiritual disadvantage. If you, if you have all of your basic necessities, if you have food, if you have a house, if you have an Amazon Prime account, if, if you've got you know, a shipped account or a Grubhub and you're getting food delivered to you, then, then you never have to pray, God, give me this day my daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. If you have all kinds of entertainment options, then, then you can live a life of distraction and never focus on God. I think one of the things that this pandemic has done is it's stripped away a lot of our distractions. It's stripped away a lot of the things, the temporal things that we've used to hide our hearts and our souls behind. And they've been laid bare. And all of a sudden, we, we look at ourselves and we see really what, what's deep inside of us. And for some of us, it's not pretty. Because it's been a carrot that we've been chasing for money and stuff. And when that stuff is stripped away and we no longer have it, we look inside and we see our, that it's empty. It didn't deliver on what it promised. We, we were seeking for something temporal when we should have been seeking for something eternal. We need less stuff and more God. Our culture is constantly inundating us with this idea that what we don't have is what we need. You need a better TV, a better uh, phone, faster internet, the best clothes, the matching purse and the matching glasses, better car and a bigger house, more vacations, to go to more exotic places. It's selling you this idea that what you don't have is what you need. And that's a carrot. What you need is God. Because what ends up happening is you get all that stuff and it goes in your closet and then a year later you Marie Kondo it. You give it away. The psalmist says this, if wealth increases, don't set your heart upon it. That's what the guy who came to Jesus who was so wealthy realized when Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, if you want to love perfectly, then give all your money away and give it to the poor. And he realized that he had set his heart upon it. He was holding it like this rather than like this. Now I think most of us know this in our hearts, but our daily lifestyle, our daily living, our daily actions, we, we live a different thing. We know deep down in our heart that this is a temporal stuff, that it's not eternal, but our actions deceive us. Our actions show that really what's down in there that we think is that the next thing that we have, that'll bring happiness. Here, here's the spiritual disadvantage. When we think that money will solve all of our problems, we're spiritually disadvantaged. More money's not gonna 
help your kid get off drugs. More money is not going to solve the problems in your marriage. More money is not going to make you less depressed. More money isn't going to keep your loved one from getting cancer. Here's one of the crazy ironies is that the richest countries in the world are some of the highest depression and anxiety rates. The richest countries in the world. The United States has one of the highest depression and anxiety rates. We, we have more money than, than the vast majority of people and yet we're more depressed and more anxious. Money isn't solving our problems. We don't need more of what's temporal. We don't need more money. We need more of what's eternal. We need more of Jesus. Paul, the first missionary of the church and the author of many of the books of the Bible, writes this uh, amazing set of letters to his mentor, his mentee, Timothy, and, and he, he's telling him how to interact with rich people. And, and here's the thing is when you read this, don't think of it as somebody else over there, but Paul is telling Timothy how to interact with each one of us. And here's what he says. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for your enjoyment. Now remember, it's not wrong to make money honestly and ethically and justly. Again, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm trying to make you feel responsible. Because that's what Paul does. Paul here says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Remember, Paul's talking to Timothy about us, about me, about how to talk to me how to talk to you. Paul goes on, he says, in this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Here's some things I want you to say with me. God has blessed me with more than I need. I am rich, but I will not trust in earthly things and stuff. I will trust in God who richly provides. Because I have more, I will do more and give more. Some of you have a pile of money in the bank, but you have no peace in your heart. I'm really speaking to you today. Don't chase that carrot of pile of money in the bank. Chase the thing that's true, the thing that's eternal. Put your hope, put your trust in God, who's the one who richly provides. Remember what Paul said? To take hold of the life that truly is life to take hold of the life that it truly is life. Don't just spend money because it excites you in the moment. That's a carrot. It's, it's selling something that it's never going to deliver on. Buy something that is eternal. Do something that really matters with your life. Live simply so that others can simply live. Here's a litmus test for where you're investing your heart. When your stimulus check came, when it was, you know, this is like money that fell from heaven, like right into our bank accounts, right? <laughs> What'd you do with that stimulus check? Now, ironically, Sarah and I uh, miscalculated our taxes this year, and we had to use some of it to pay for taxes and a little bit to pay for some medical bills and a surgery. But before all of that even became clear to us, we had set it aside in a, in a different, a special account. It was our like do good account. And we were having fun giving it away, like looking for opportunities to give away. We had this money and we were, it was like, it was exciting to say, how can we do good with this? If, you, if we get it, I mean, there's like rumors, right, about whether we're gonna get another stimulus check. And, and if we do, um, what, uh, what are you gonna do with it? Now, listen, if you're struggling, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, pay your bills with it. But if you're in that place where you're not struggling, do some good. Here's the carrot, do you remember the carrot? All right, here's the carrot. What you don't have is what you need. Here's the real thing. Don't pursue that. Pursue God. Pursue what's eternal. Let me end with this little warning from the author of Ecclesiastes. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Don't chase after that carrot. Chase after God.